but we can't control the weather. So that's, uh, that's just for John birds. And Albie, I'll be the first to admit that that this section is not exciting. I mean, when we do examples with these numerical integration techniques, they're not going to be exciting examples, but it does, the following, it does need to be understood. Many <laughs> important functions cannot be integrated by In fact, it's kind of a miracle to me that we can integrate as many important functions as we can integrate. And I mean, this is, I wouldn't say this is the world's most important function, but just as an example, The sine of one over x dx. This is not some super complicated function that I had to spend hours creating. You sometimes see that in mathematics where mathematicians will come up with some example when it's so abstract and out there that it's like, okay, who cares about this? But this isn't that at all. I mean, one over X is a very simple function. The sign is a relatively simple function. We put them together via composition and we get something that we can't integrate just like that. So, I mean, more to the point for this section, if we can't take indefinite integrals, then we can't take definite integrals because the only method we've learned in this class for taking definite integrals is the fundamental theorem of calculus. <laughs> and I mean, we can go through these. Um, it's not U substitution. We do have a composition, but we don't have the derivative of the inside function out there. It's not integration by parts. We don't have a product. The trick we've seen before, where maybe we rewrite it as a product, doesn't work. Um, this is not a power of a trig function. It doesn't have square roots. So there's nothing in this that makes it look like trig substitution. This is not a rational function. So it's not partial fraction decomposition. We genuinely don't know anything that seems likely to help us here. So we say, well, we can't use the fundamental theorem of calculus to find this thing. Can we somehow numerically approximate the answer? 
And I could say a few words in defense of numerical approximation. I mean, the way it sort of gets presented in textbooks is as an afterthought. Here are all of the techniques we want you to use, but if none of those work, you can use numerical approximation, I guess. <clears throat> but I mean, in the real world, any computer algorithm you use is overwhelmingly going to be using numerical approximation techniques. I mean, this is how calculus is done in the real world. And we shouldn't let that get us down, because I mean, imagine we have a simple integral. Imagine we have this integral. Well, we can get this far really easily using the fundamental theorem of calculus, but then the sine of two and the sine of one are both infinite decimals. And if we want to do anything with this answer, um, we can't order the sine of two minus the sine of one milligrams of a drug. If we want to do anything with this answer, we're going to have to approximate the sine of two and approximate the sine of one. In other words, we're going to have to round. So even in a situation like this, um, and of course, you've seen this on all of my quizzes, round your answers to three decimal places. Even when you can take the integral, you're going to wind up 99 times out of 100 with a numerical approximation. So we shouldn't see this as some kind of failure state. Because, I mean, most integrals we take are going to end up with some kind of approximation in it one way or the other. There are three methods normally taught in the calculus books. I'm sure that if you went on Wikipedia and you looked for numerical approximation of integrals, you could find <laughs> you could find dozens of other techniques, but these um, techniques that we're going to present are very standard and Probably we'll end up doing two of them today and one of them tomorrow, but we'll see. <laughs> and I guess the first thing we should observe. <laughs> Lord. The first thing we should observe is that we've actually done a numerical approximation before. Thinking way back before, before we ever uttered the word definite integral, we were talking about finding areas under curves. And we now know that the area under a curve is a definite integral. And we talked about, well, we don't know how to find the areas under curves. How can we approximate the areas under the curves? And we came up with the idea of a Riemann sum. 
we chop the interval into pieces. In each of these pieces, we select a point. <laughs> And we create rectangles and we can find the areas of the rectangles. So we just add all of those areas up. As I say, this was the Riemann sum. And then you take a limit and your Riemann sum turns into an integral. But if you don't take a limit, if you just leave that sum as it is, then you've got an approximation of an integral. So the first of the three methods is just, or maybe I should put just in scare quotes, but it's Riemann sums. We approximate a function by creating these sums. And in particular, We're going to talk about the midpoint rule. When you're creating Riemann sums, you have to make a bunch of choices. And um, if you're creating computer programs, and you don't want your program to constantly be calling random variables, the fewer choices we make, the better. So in particular, when we're creating a Riemann sum and we've got an interval, we need to pick a point in the interval. Picking the point, remember, is how we generate the rectangle because we go up to the curve and then we create a horizontal line segment and we generate the rectangle like so. You might be able to intuit midpoint, midway, when we're using Riemann sums to approximate an area, we, if we're using the midpoint rule, we select the little the center of the interval. We select the midpoint, hence the name. And the midpoint, I mean, you can create all kinds of examples, but selecting the midpoint often works out quite well. What, in terms of, uh, you know, what's a good point to select? You know, if we look here, we've selected the midpoint. We're getting some area here that we don't want, right? This is not area under the curve, but it is area inside the rectangle. But we're also getting 
are also missing, I should say, area here that we do want. And if you look at this picture, the area that we have that we don't want and the area that we're missing that we do want seem to be pretty similar to each other. And this missing area and this unwanted area will hopefully more or less cancel out to give us a very good approximation of the area under the curve uh, um, on this little interval, what I should say. Let's make an assumption. Um, there's nothing in the definition of a Riemann sum that says that your intervals have to be of equal length. So this could be our interval, and then this could be our midpoint, and we create the rectangle. And this rectangle is wider than this rectangle. Well, as I say, there's nothing in the in the definition of a Riemann sum that stops us from doing this. But when we're using the midpoint rule, we'll start by choosing how many rectangles we are going to use. And the number of rectangles is always called N for number. It's very standard. And then we're going to let all of our rectangles angles be of the same length. And that length is going to be B minus A over N. So, you know, going back, <coughs> going back here, we've got This function we're interested in, and we're going from one to two. And the sign is doing, uh, I think the sign of one over x is going to look something like that. But, um, we are trying to approximate that area. And we decide we're going to use n rectangles. Then delta x is going to be two minus one, the beginning and the end point of the intervals we subtract them divided by n. So one tenth. So one is ten tenths. Eleven tenths. Twelve tenths. Each of these rectangles has a width of one tenth. And my scale is completely 
more, but we keep doing this uh, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. We keep doing this until we get to B. So there's your partitioning. Um, the midpoint rule is kind. Let me see. Well, before I say anything like there's a trade-off here. Um, the bigger ten, the bigger n is, the better your approximation is going to be, but the slower it's going to be to do to use the midpoint rule. So let me write this down. Big N is good, but slower. Of course, computer technology is making a lot of these considerations more and more irrelevant. Like the, I can say that, you know, a big N will make things slower, but on a computer, you could that N be in a hundred thousand, and slower means that it takes an extra tenth of a second for the computer to run. So this isn't really a uh, a big consideration in this day and age. So we have our function. We have divided our interval into equal sized sub intervals. And now to use the midpoint rule, well, we select the midpoint of each of these subintervals, and we use the midpoint to create these rectangles. And we add up, we find all of those areas and we add them up. And that's our approximation. Our approximation is a Riemann sum. Let's see how this. <laughs> Let's see how this works in practice. And I mean, the answer is that in practice, if you're really going to do this by hand, it's pretty tedious. That's the, that's the one thing I sort of dislike about this class since we don't have don't really have computer technology that we use. Some stuff like this becomes more tedious than it should be. But this was the very first example I put on the board. So let's try to evaluate this integral using the midpoint rule. And I am going to somewhat 
arbitrarily select an equals six. Again, in the real world, you're doing this on a computer. Your computer will probably decide what N should be for you. You probably won't even have to tell it. But N equals six is what we will select. And delta X is going to be the end point subtract. Did or divided by six equals one six. So I sort of guessed at the graph of this. Let's go ahead and take a look at. the graph of this before we go any further, just so I'm not drawing complete nonsense on the whiteboard. Here's the sign of one over X, and X is stuck between one and two. So there we go, if we, for nearer to zero, we'd have all sorts of stuff, but on the interval we're looking at, we just have this nice little curve. So here's one and here's two. And let me see, this is going to be easier if we work with improper fractions. One is six, six, two is 12 of six. And the reason that I selected six, the rectangle sizes are one six. So six six, seven six, eight six, nine six. I am so bad at drawing anything remote to scale. This will now be 11 sixths, 12 sixths out there. And let me extend that curve. So the midpoint rule is it's kind of a nuisance, or I've always found it a bit of a nuisance. It's my least favorite of the three rules, just because, okay, we've created this, we've cut this interval into these little rectangles, but we're not good to go because the midpoint rule requires the midpoint, and we don't have any of those midpoints on the board. So as I say, we cannot use the midpoint rule yet. We still have work to do. So finding midpoints, I mean, it's not hard. I just find all of this a little tedious. The midpoint between six sixths and seven sixths is going to be their average. Add them up, divide by two. So seven plus six, 13 sixths divided by two. The first midpoint is going to be 13 twelfths. 
And the second midpoint, again, we take the average of these. It's going to be 15 twelfths. The good news is that these midpoints are also equally spaced. So from 13 twelfths to 15 twelfths, that's two twelfths. The next midpoint is going to be 17 twelfths, 19 twelfths, 21 twelfths, 23 twelfths. And now we can use the midpoint rule more or less. So now we use these midpoints to create this Riemann sum. So the area of this rectangle, is everyone, I realize I've sort of been droning on, is everybody following this so far? Does anybody have any questions? So the area of a rectangle is its base times its height. Its base is delta x, one sixth. Its height is the function with the midpoint stuck inside of it. So at the moment, we are just looking at this first rectangle. So our function is the sine of one over x. So one six times the sine of one divided by thirteen twelfths, which we could. which we could rewrite in that way. Um, one divided by a fraction is the same as the reciprocal of the fraction. So this is by no means the answer, but this is one sixth of the answer. This is the area of that first rectangle. And we now, we now have to repeat this process five more times. I warned you that when we start to be doing examples with the midpoint rule, I warned you that it wouldn't be exciting. So we've got one sixth times the sine of one divided by 13 twelfths. And that one divided by 13 twelfths, we can rewrite if we want to. This second rectangle. Well, the base is once again one six. And now we take the function 
and we stick the midpoint in. We stick in 15 twelfths. And I guess, I mean, we shouldn't have called this tedious and it is tedious, but we shouldn't exaggerate. I mean, once we get this pattern down, one sixth times the sign of one divided by 17 twelfths. And then one sixth times the sign of one divided by the next midpoint is 19 twelfths. Thus one divided by six times the sign, the next midpoint is 21 twelfths. And the final midpoint is 23 twelfths. <laughs> So we could simplify this a little, um, not a whole lot, but we do see that all of these expressions have a one sixth in front of them, and we can then just pull that one sixth. We can rewrite, we can pull the one sixth out. Come on, zoom, don't be irritating. And get that. And then in this particular case, again, we have all of these uh, reciprocals of fractions. One sixth times the sign of 12 thirteenths. And then it's going to be 12 fifteenths, 12 seventeenths, 12 nineteenths, twelve. Twenty first, twelve, twenty third. And again, all I'm doing here is I'm using the fact that one divided by a fraction is the reciprocal of the fraction. So this one divided by twenty one over twelve. became that 12 over 21. Um, at the end of the day, there is no getting around this. I mean, this is not a useful way to have an answer written. We'd better go to our calculator. <laughs> And let's see, we've got one divided by six. And then in parentheses, we've got the sign of a goldfish, 12 thirteenths.
12, 13. Thus, the sine of 12, 15. Plus the sine of 12, 17. Plus the sine of 12, 19. Plus the sine of 12, over 21. Plus the sine of 12 over 23. And that was the last one. We close that parenthesis. We close the first parenthesis. And we get our answer. Or, I mean, I should say, we get the numerical approximation of our answer. But again, even if we'd used the fundamental theorem of calculus, we'd have ended up rounding the however many decimal places, and we'd still have had a numerical approximation. So this isn't some terrible thing. Let me see if I can make Wolfram Alpha So Wolfram Alpha is a sort of because it's self natural language mathematics, which means that I'm supposed to be able to just type in things like this. And Wolfram Alpha will understand this. It can be a little kitschy, truth be told, but let's see if it will um, give its own approximation of this integral. So you see, I, um, this integral is or this antiderivative is so important. We get this sort of strange function you've never seen before and will never see again, but it was explicitly created to be used for problems like this. But what I'm interested in here is point. Which we could must be a way to zoom in, but 0.632568 versus wrong share, 0.632. So we appear to be accurate up to the first three decimal places, which Again, when you consider that a computer could you could that n be a hundred um, just as easily as we let n be six? I mean, the midpoint rule works well at the end of the day. What the midpoint rule does require, we're not going to be able to start the trapezoidal rule, but we can introduce it. What the midpoint rule does require is that you have a function. You have f of x. Say that instead of having f of x, you have a table of observations. Let's call our observations C of X. F 
And from this table, we want to approximate the integral of this function. This is, I mean, this is probably the, I, I mean, I always feel a little like it's all real world, but this is probably the most real world calculus integral problem that we can imagine. I mean, the vast majority of functions that we're interested in, we don't actually have an equation for, we instead have a table of data. Like we're performing clinical experiments and we're taking blood work every hour. So we know what the patient's um, various vital signs are every hour. We don't have a function for that though. I mean, we can't say, oh, this patient's heart rate is the sign of 17 divided by X, but we don't have anything like that. Um, from just a table, we can approximate the integral of this function. And that is what the next rule, the trapezoidal rule, is going to help us to do. So I said, uh, I predicted we do two um, this class and finish next class. We did one this class, but I still think we'll probably finish the section on Tuesday. At least I hope we will with the weather looking ominous. I like to not get behind. There's something happens.